is Daryl Abrams, and I will be discussing awake and fully mobile patients on cardiac extracorporeal life support. Critical illness weakness has been recognized as a common consequence of severe critical illness, with several risk factors having been identified, including prolonged mechanical ventilation, sedation, and prolonged bed rest. Several studies, including a study of survivors of the acute respiratory distress syndrome, have demonstrated low physical and mental scores among survivors as a reflection of their critical illness weakness. As a consequence, there has been an increased focus on early mobilization as a way to minimize the rate of critical illness weakness and improve outcomes. Early mobilization does appear to be safe in patients within the intensive care unit, as demonstrated in a systematic review in 2017. In over 7,500 patients evaluated, the rate of potential safety events was only 2.6% and of consequential events only 0.6%, amounting to 86 events over, over more than 14,000 physical therapy sessions. So while it appears to be safe, the question remains, does early mobilization lead to more favorable outcomes? In a prospective study of patients receiving early mobilization or standard of care lack of early mobilization, there was an increased risk of in return to independent functional status at discharge, decrease in ICU delirium, and increase in ventilator-free days among those who received early mobilization. However, in a more recent study in 2016, these findings were not consistent, with no difference in any major patient-centered outcomes in those who received early mobilization versus usual care. In reality, the truth is probably somewhere in between. In a systematic review of all ICU patients with a length of stay more than 24 hours in 2017, 14 studies were reviewed, including over 1,700 patients. And while there was a, an increase in the rate of being alive and out of the hospital at 180 days, there was no difference in short or long-term mortality. So what can we say thus far? Early mobilization can be done safely in intensive care unit patients. It may have a benefit in patient-centered outcomes. We can say that ECMO patients have the most severe forms of cardiac or respiratory failure. So the question is, can and should we do it in ECMO patients? And if so, how? So here we have an example of a patient that would be an excellent candidate for early mobilization. He's awake, he's extubated, and he's cannulated with ECMO in an upper body configuration. So let's explore this a little bit more. The important factors to consider is anyone who's being considered for early mobilization on extracorporeal support is the cannulation strategy employed, the circuitry being used, the type of patient to be selected, whether they're a bridge to recovery, a bridge to transplantation, or in certain cardiac conditions, a bridge to decision. What are the management strategies being employed? Are they awake? Are they able to be liberated from the ventilator? And if you're going to mobilize someone, can you do it in a multidisciplinary fashion? So let's explore each of these. First, cannulation and configuration. What we need to make sure is that the cannulation configuration is able to provide adequate cardiopulmonary support, and ideally, we minimize femoral cannulation. So within this, let's talk about each type of cannulation strategy starting with veno-arterial ECMO, where we can provide cardiac support, and in certain select cases where needed, we can provide respiratory support as well. Veno-arterial ECMO tends to be employed through femoral veno-arterial cannulation. The problem with femoral veno-arterial cannulation is twofold. One, from a mobilization standpoint, there are cannulas coming out of the femoral artery and vein, which may limit the ability to mobilize the patient and move their legs. Secondly, because you're cannulating from below, the reinfusion of oxygenated blood is going retrograde up the aorta and may be insufficient to supply the upper body with adequate oxygenation, particularly when there's na residual native cardiac output and impaired gas exchange. Do we have any other alternatives? There are a few other cannulation strategies that have been tried and can be employed to minimize the groin cannulation of femoral VA ECMO and also optimize upper body oxygenation. Some of these approaches include the so-called sport model, where we employ internal jugular venous drainage and cannulation of the subclavian artery via a graft in an end-to-side fashion in order to supply the aortic arch 
the carotids and the coronaries with well oxygenated blood. For those patients in whom the subclavian artery is too small a target for a graft to be sewn on, we may employ a more central approach where the graft is sewed onto the innominate artery, a potentially larger target than the subclavian artery for the same concept of internal jugular venous drainage and innominate artery reinfusion for improved aortic arch and carotid and coronary oxygenation. In some subjects, it may be necessary that despite these cannulation strategies, there, there is a requirement for left ventricular venting due to left ventricular overdistension. One strategy that's been employed by Takeda and colleagues is to still have drainage via uh, either the inferior or superior vena cava, reinfusion through the subclavian artery through a graft, and simultaneously another drainage cannula wide into the IVC drainage where the left ventral can be directly vented through a stab incision into the thoracic cavity. In subjects who were started on this cannulation strategy but then no longer need the gas exchange support of ECMO, the drainage cannula from the vena cava can be removed and you can remain on an apical axillary VAD configuration where there is drainage from the left ventricle and reinfusion through that graft into the subclavian artery. Other central strategies that have been employed and described include central cannulation with right atrial drainage and aortic reinfusion, though this requires a sternotomy, whereas the other approaches may be able to avoid sternotomy. In select cardiac patients who have pulmonary hypertension and preserved left ventricular function, one may consider a venovenous approach instead of a venoarterial approach. In patients with pre-existing atrial septal defects or septostomies, one can use a bicable dual lumen venovenous cannula through the internal jugular vein and direct the reinfusion jet of the cannula towards the interatrial defect, thereby providing an oxygenated right to left shunt, decompressing the right ventricle and supplying adequate oxygenation to the upper body. However, this approach does require preserved left ventricular function to eject the oxygenated blood. That's the cardiac cannulation. But what about respiratory? In respiratory ECMO, all you really require is venovenous ECMO, which provides gas exchange support, but does not provide hemodynamic support. The conventional venovenous ECMO configuration is a two-site cannulation strategy with drainage through the femoral vein into the inferior vena cava and reinfusion of blood through a cannula inserted in the internal jugular vein and situated with its tip near the superior vena cava right atrial junction. The problem with this approach in venovenous ECMO, again, is the presence of a femoral cannula and potential limitations in mobilization. A strategy that can be employed is with the same bicable venovenous dual lumen cannula mentioned previously for pH, but performing it in a patient with re pure respiratory failure through the internal jugular vein. Here, the reinfusion jet is directed towards the tricuspid valve, whereas the drainage ports are located separately in the IVC and SVC thereby minimizing the amount of oxygenated blood that is sucked back up into the cannula and also avoiding femoral cannulation, thereby facilitating early mobilization. Now let's discuss patient selection. In whom should we be performing early mobilization? The priority should be based on the needs of the patient and the feasibility of that patient in achieving mobility. Perhaps the most obvious target for early mobilization for patients receiving extracorporeal support is the bridge to transplant population, both for bridge to lung transplant and bridge to heart transplant. Historically, bridge to transplant survival has been very poor for those either requiring mechanical ventilation and even worse for those requiring ECMO support. However, there have been significant improvements since that time. The risk benefit profile of ECMO is more favorable. There have been advances in cannulation strategies and there've been changes in patient selection, timing, and management once on extracorporeal support, all of which has led to more favorable impact on carefully selected candidates for early mobilization. And we must consider balancing the need for mobilization with the risk of mobilization and in whom ECMO is appropriate as a bridge to transplant. The International Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation has recommended ECMO as a bridge to transplant for those who are of younger age, who don't have other organ failures, and who have great rehab potential. But there are contraindications for ECMO as a bridge to transplant 
and one can imagine that many of these contraindications will likewise limit their ability to mobilize. The ultimate goal here should be optimization of physical therapy before the onset of severe debility. In the subset of patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension and in those patients with cardiac failure awaiting bridge to transplant, it's really important that we institute ECMO support in order to prevent hemodynamic collapse, which may be less predictable, particularly in the pulmonary hypertension population. Once patients are supported with ECMO as a bridge to transplant, there are several strategies that are important to emphasize. One is the minimization of sedation. Because patients who are cannulated and sedated will be unable to perform early mobilization and may quickly become deconditioned and not be transplant candidates. Likewise, whenever possible, mechanical ventilation through an endotracheal tube should be avoided in order to further facilitate early mobilization and minimize the risk of ventilator-associated complications. One should consider early tracheostomy if there is an anticipated prolonged need for mechanical ventilation pre-transplant. And in the subset of these patients, with significant secretions, a tracheostomy may facilitate airway clearance. The key to all of this, though, is avoiding deconditioning, and so there must be a priority placed on mobilization for patients who are ECMO as bridge to transplant. A study published in 2017 of an ECMO as bridge to lung transplant population experience out of a single center highlights the importance of early mobilization in an awake and extubated strategy for success for transplantation. In a cohort of 72 patients, the overall survival was about 56%, with very good post-transplant survival to discharge. The key differences identified between successful and unsuccessful bridging to transplantation included the need for pressors, a high severity of illness score, ambulation, and the underlying severity of illness. But we can see that those who were successfully bridged to transplantation ambulated at a rate of 80% compared to only 56% in those who were not successfully bridged. The need for mechanical ventilation varied, and it's important to note that 47% of patient days were off of mechanical ventilation during ECMO support as a bridge to transplant. Of those patients who were not ambulatory in this population, all eight of those patients did active physical therapy at the bedside, and all of those patients received less than seven days of ECMO support prior to transplantation. So the bridge to transplant population is perhaps the most obvious target for early mobilization to maintain a transplant candidacy. But what about the bridge to recovery population? Well, the data for the cardiac population as bridge to recovery from ECMO is very limited, but it can be informed by the respiratory population. In the cardiac population, however, we must pay careful consideration to the impact of mobilization on hemodynamics and what, if anything, we can do with the ECMO circuit to mitigate any risk in the hemodynamic realm. We can see from a cohort of patients that, were, that participated in early mobilization at a single center back in 2014, bridged in, bridge to recovery specifically, early mobilization was feasible, including in, a, in these patients in whom there was a high severity of illness score pre, uh, pre-cannulation with very low oxygenation and, and uh, severely impaired ventilation. In these bridge to recovery patients, six of those patients were able to be ambulatory, and when they were walking, they walked substantial distances. Furthermore, one can see that the disposition of the survivors who were uh, on ECMO as bridge to recovery was quite favorable, with all but one patient discharged to home or acute rehabilitation. But what other strategies are important to emphasize in patients who are bridge to recovery? Well, sedation strategy matters significantly. In a cohort of patients receiving ECMO as bridge to recovery for acute respiratory distress syndrome, consultation with a physical therapy team was associated with a lower mortality. What's also important to highlight from this cohort study is that the level of sedation greatly impacted their participation in physical therapy, with those with SAS scores of three or four more awake sedation statuses were those that were able to participate in sitting and standing. A SAS of two or one basically limited their activity to passive range of motion. Regarding cannulation configuration, The question then arises, must you have an upper body configuration, or is it possible to perform early mobilization with a femoral cannulation approach? Well, in this large cohort of patients, including 167 patients receiving ECMO as bridge to recovery, including over 600 physical therapy sessions while receiving ECMO, 
there was at least one femoral cannula present in patients 80% of the time. 13 patients with femoral cannulae were able to do at least standing, if not greater physical therapy. Eight patients were able to walk with femoral cannulae, including three patients who were bifemorally cannulated, two of whom were on venoarterial ECMO. And this is an important point to emphasize for the cardiac population who is more likely to be cannulated with femoral venoarterial ECMO. And with all of those physical therapy sessions, there were only three complications, none of which were major. Of the survivors, which included 109 subjects, 93% were discharged to home or acute rehabilitation, as opposed to a subacute nursing facility or long-term acute care hospital. So if one is going to mobilize a patient on ECMO, how do they do it? All of the large cohort studies that have described success with early mobilization of patients receiving ECMO have emphasized a multidisciplinary approach to early mobilization. From the initial assessment to the preparation for physical therapy to the initiation of physical therapy itself. And this point cannot be overemphasized. It takes a multidisciplinary team to ensure safe and successful mobilization of patients on ECMO support, including participation by physical and occupational therapy, bedside nurses, perfusionists, nurse practitioners where appropriate, respiratory therapists where appropriate, and intensivists and surgeons. Some of the important points to emphasize or to ensure adequate hemodynamic monitoring and ability to respond to hemodynamic instability, along with respiratory insufficiency in patients being mobilized. What may be necessary is augmentation of ECMO blood flow and ECMO sweep gas flow to mitigate any instability in hemodynamics or gas exchange. Also, it is important to emphasize close monitoring of the cannulas and tubing to ensure maintenance of good ECMO blood flow throughout mobilization so as not to compromise their cardiac and respiratory support. So in summary, early mobilization, including ambulation, is feasible in ECMO patients. It is certainly facilitated by an awake, extubated strategy. Femoral cannulation may be safe, but certainly upper body cannulation is easier to mobilize with. Early mobilization is vital for the bridge to transplant population in order to maintain transplant candidacy. However, the impact on bridge to recovery patients and outcomes remains less clear, and a multidisciplinary approach is strongly recommended. Thank you very much.